Yes, Barry, I do talk about other things that aren't related to the rubber kid. Case in point, this is One Punch Man, the story of a bald man that wears latex gloves, and he's on a journey to find the single greatest deals in every grocery store and supermarket across the land. But mostly on Saturdays and Wednesdays, because that's when they have the big vegetable blowout sale. You could get vegetables for 50% off. 50% off on zucchini? That's a pretty big deal if you ask me, all right? So, uh, no, we're gonna be talking about the cadres today. I don't know what I'm doing with my hands right now, but I'm just gonna keep on doing it. Cadres, all right? You know, whenever you introduce your main villain group in the story, I mean, their names are important. You gotta come up with something unique, usually a different language than Japanese to make them stand out. You know, Bleach has the Espada and the Stern Rita, and then you have the Ten Commandments in uh, Seven Deadly Sins. You know, Fairy Tale, honestly, Fairy Tale just follows the exact same kind of methodology of just naming them after numbers. If you've read Fairy Tale, you know what I mean. Like the Element Four, the Oration Seis, which are just the six prayers. It was like the 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 twelve, the Spriggan Twelve, the Nine Demon Gates, the uh, Seven Kin of Purgatory. That was the the angle Mashima was not Mashima. Yeah, Hiro Mashima. That's what Mashima was doing there. So with One Punch Man for the uh, the top members, the strongest members of the Monster Association, we have Cadre. Now in some translations they don't use Cadre. They just use the executives, like the the top executives or the high executives of the Monster Association. I don't care. I don't care if it's an official translation or what. Cadre was the first uh, term I used to describe that group, and that's what we're going with because it's different. It's a French term, and uh, it just means like high-ranking members in a particular group and stuff. So we're just gonna go with Cadre. All right. So um, there are nine members of the Cadre that make up the Monster Association. This is not going to include Monster King Orochi. Uh, for one thing, I already did a video about him, but also he was kind of built up to be their leader. And it also doesn't include uh, Psychos, I mean, Yorogoro. It doesn't include Yorogoro either, because uh, also, once again, more of a leader rather than like an executive, okay? Kind of the boss that orders people around and kind of gathered everybody together there. So, you know, we have nine to go through. Some of them were in the original webcomic, and there were actually two that were introduced, well, actually three that were introduced in the manga as executives, okay? So first off, let's, let's go through the ones that were added later in the Murata version of the manga, um, because uh, we actually saw some of those in the anime already in season two. Uh, let's start with somebody that was very prominent in the last chapter. Let's start with Nyan. So Nyan is a cat monster. Not really much to speak of in terms of aesthetic. He looks like a humanoid kitty cat with a little bell. And the reason he turned into a monster was because he was just used to be a cat, but he was like doted on by like people all the time. Like he probably had a master that was like an old lady. It's just like, oh, little furry bell, I love you so much. And the cat hated it. And then it's One Punch Man. So it turned into a monster that was a dragon level threat that could literally level cities. Anybody that's owned a cat you can probably attest to this, okay? It actually reminds me, you ever see the uh, movie Cats and Dogs? Uh, man, with Jeff Goldblum, that, that's the kind of a way back thing. That was like early 2000s that came out. That was actually one of my favorite movies growing up. I love that, when the dogs had like that secret underground society. But um, yeah, the cat, that was the main villain of that uh, movie. That kind of makes me remind of this, like, you know, like just a cat that's like, oh, Mr. Tinkers, I forget its name or whatever. But then this cat is just doted on and eventually turns into this like evil cat monster, okay? And Neon has a bunch of abilities that are, you know, suited for kitty cats. Like, for example, he can, he's, he's very flexible. He can bend in and out between things, even as small as, like, a one millimeter long crack. He can just sneak in and, like, worm his way through the walls, as cats are pretty good at sneaking and fitting around tight places and stuff like that. Um, obviously, Neon has claws. Uh, in the last chapter, they were looking kind of like Freddy Krueger-esque, you know, pretty long claws. Um, they can slice through pretty much everything, except the, the, uh, stone-cold bristle armor of Puri Puri Prisoner all right, so that's pretty thick body hair there to cut through, right? Um, actually, I think Neon was able to cut through it, but it wasn't able to, like, cause any serious damage to Puri Puri Prisoner there. Um, beyond that, though, because he is a cat, uh, and he even stated this in the last chapter while going a little bit Shezure there, you know, from Alice in Wonderland, the Shezure, oh god, that is terrifying. <laughs> if, imagine you wake up in the middle of the night, and you're like, you have a little kitty cat, right, and your kitty cat sleeps in your room, or the, the cat sleeps wherever the cat wants to sleep, honestly, but, you know, you fall asleep, like, good night, I don't know, friggin' Chloe, that's one of my friends. I don't, I've never owned cats. That's actually Casey's cat's name. But I was like, good night, Chloe. And then you just open your eyes in the middle of the night, and then you just see this staring at you in the darkness. 
<laughs> and it just begins to rise up slowly. And then the cat is like, I have been reborn. All those times you sprayed me with a water bottle to get off the couch. It's my couch now, you know? Um, and that's, that's kind of the theme with One Punch Man. Whenever you get a monster that has a really weird appearance, it's just like, it's just a cat, really. But no, it's like, no, it takes its design and its, uh, its personality from all the things that like, oh yeah, like in this situation, spraying it with water, it would come to life as like a monster and like, you know, destroy its owner's house because of that. Like that kind of fits with the theme of One Punch Man, you know? So it's goofy. Um, and something else that Neon stated from the last chapter was, you know, I just can't resist playing with toys until they're broken. You know, it's a lot more ominous in this regard because, you know, he busts out the Freddy Krueger claws and just like <laughs> starts tearing through all of the freaking heroes that have assembled outside as sort of like the, um, the, not the Vanguard unit, that would have been the S-Class heroes that went in, but sort of like the, um, you know, the supplemental. They're sort of there just to make sure that monsters get out, they are, like, taken care of immediately, um, you know, and so it's just, it, Neon just tears through all of them, like, they don't even have a chance, you know, just one swing of this thing's claws and just, like, a typhoon of, like, wind scythes just rip through you, all right? Um, on top of that, it's pretty much impossible to capture him, uh, as I said, the aforementioned being able to, like, squeeze through tight spaces, um, that plant hero, Green, I think his name was, he can control plant life, he causes roots to, like, completely encroach on Neon's body, and Neon just kind of just weasels his way through it, or kitties his way through it there. Um, probably the single most impressive feat that we've seen him do, um, aside from surviving a fight with Puri Puri Prisoner, is Poison, who's this, I think he was actually the lowest ranked hero in the association, like, he's, that doesn't mean he's the weakest, that just means he's the newest, and so he shows up, and he has this little, uh, tiny little dagger thing, little knife that he keeps on his hand, and it's like an extremely fast-acting, like, corrosive, more like acid kind of poison, where we've seen how this, uh, you know, acts whenever a monster gets stabbed with this knife, they immediately begin just to bubble up and just melt into goo pretty quickly, and so Poison jumps in, and he's just like, I just need to get just, just one attack, just one cut, doesn't even need to be a deep cut, just like a scrape on this thing, and the poison will take effect, and I don't think, even if he managed to cut him, I don't think the poison would take effect the same way, because this is a, this is a dragon level threat we're dealing with here, but Neon was able to stop this knife with his eyelid. Yeah, as in like poison goes to stab him and Neon's just like, yeah, and just catches the knife in its eyelid and just like breaks it, just throws him away. Just like, nope, you're not. I mean, at that point, like when you, you know, at that point, poison was probably just like, Oh crap, we're all dead. Like, there's nothing we can do. It blocked a knife with its eyelid, for God's sake. We're screwed, you know? Like, what the hell can we do about that? You know? Like, um, we could try to not aim for its eyes, and maybe that'll work. I don't know. Um, and for right now, we actually don't know, because Neon basically shredded its way through all of the different, uh, you know, supplemental heroes, and now he's, uh, trying to chase after the kid, and so that's where the last chapter actually ended off, so we don't know where that's at. Um, but other than that, uh, he does have, like, the nature of a cat, so whenever he went up against Puri Puri Prisoner, because Puri Puri Prisoner is all about the love, you know, come here, kitty. Let me give you an angel hug. The cat was just like, I can't stand that because it reminded him too much of his old master. And that was like kind of the whole reason he became a monster to begin with and like left. So against opponents like, like Puri Puri Prisoner is like the worst possible matchup for Neon. Um, and I think if it was in a serious brawl, because most of the fight, Neon attacked him. But then after Puri Puri showed his like colors to him, he was like, screw this, I'm out. And he tried to squeeze through the walls. It was more of like just trying to escape from him. In a straight-up fight between Neon and Puri Puri, I mean, considering that his attacks... I mean, his attacks might do, like, double damage to Neon. Like, an angel hug to Neon might actually, like, cause serious damage. Like, not so much physical, but psychological damage to this monster. Alright, so, because in the webcomic, Puri Puri Prisoner did not really get a full serious battle in the Monster Association. He got beaten pretty handily. Um, and he got beaten by Garo a few chapters ago, right? But also, 
it's just like he runs into um, uh, Super Alloy and kind of gives him some words of encouragement, kind of gets him back in the battle. But Puri Puri Prisoner, he didn't really participate. I mean, he was there, he did stuff, uh, but he wasn't like, you know, squaring up and defeating like another cadre or anything like that. Um, so maybe Neon currently exists in the story for Puri Puri Prisoner to have a battle against, you know, like he'll pop up out of the ground like, who is defeating all of these lovely heroes? And he sees that Neon there is like, ah, Kitty Cat, this is where you wandered off to. Let me pet you. And then he just, char this like giant Hulk just rushes toward Neon and Neon's like, no, boom! And then just get into a serious fight there and Neon is defeated by a uh, Piri Piri prisoner. That, that would work perfectly. Let, let's go with that, uh, Murata. Let, let's go with that. Probably out of the three new cadres that were introduced in the uh, manga version as opposed to the webcomic, Neon's probably my favorite. The other two we got were Goketsu and Elder Centipede, or Sente Choro. And I think we all know where they're at right now. Uh, they're one, well, actually, no, they both got Saitama. Yeah, they're both, yeah, although Elder Centipede, he wins the prize because he got serious punched. You know, right before Elder Centipede, right before the light went out of his multiple eyes, you know, he had the honor of knowing he was going to be felled by a serious punch from Saitama. All right, so he's like, man, this is what Boros must have felt. Boom! It's like, I imagine it's a moment of sheer ecstasy because it's like, you know, all of Saitama's awesomeness is compressed into his glove and it just hits you. And the moment it connects, it's just like, you hear angels sing before you're just taken into the abyss of hell. But yeah, they both got saitama Um, You know, they weren't really around very much to have, like, personalities. Goketsu had a little bit more of a personality. He used to be a former martial artist. He was the first winner of the Super Fight Tournament, got captured by some monsters, got modified by the cells, and became Goketsu, this giant beast with multiple eyes. He actually looked a lot more terrifying in the original. Remember this? I remember this. I remember when I read the chapter and he appeared like this, and I was like, oh my god, this looks like he's like an ogre or something, right? Um, you know, but later on in the chapter, they changed it to the new design with just kind of like the blacked out, like, top half of his face and just the eyes there and I really like the original one I don't know why Murata ch uh, changed it if it was just harder to draw because this does require a lot more detail but uh, I do like that first design more but his original his, I mean, his second design is okay too but, uh, yeah, so his goal was pretty much just to go to the Super Fight Tournament and provide the combatants there with the Monster Cells to get new ranks into the Monster Association. That was pretty much their goal. Uh, he fought against Suru really quickly, and he didn't really do much there. I mean, Suru didn't really manage to hurt uh, Goketsu at all. Uh, his speed was impressive, and but nothing really worked. You know, even Suru's strongest techniques, you know, Goketsu was just, like, pinching them because he's, like, this giant dude. Um, and even after Suru hits him, like, with this like whirling hurricane like right in his face point blank Goketsu's just like you know, it's just, it's nothing to him. Um, it's rather unfortunate that his fight with Saitama actually got off-screened. Uh, so that even makes it less than Elder Centipede, right? You know, he didn't even show it. Uh, basically what happens is Goketz, uh, he leaves the arena to go back to the Monster Association. He's, like, yelling over at, uh, oh, who was it? Uh, it was that other dude, uh, Bakuzan, right? He was just like, yeah, hey, yeah, uh, come to the Monster Association. We're in City Z, whatever. The S-Class are gonna start coming out and attacking you, so you should probably get back sooner rather than later. So he leaves. Saitama shows up, defeats Bakuzan, and then he goes up to Suru, and he's like, oh, there's a monster, you have to, you, know, you can't attack him, it's no hope, it's, you're gonna die. And Saitama's like, ah, oh, okay, hold on a second. So he just goes, <laughs> leaves, and you hear the fight happening in the city, and Suru's just there, he's like, why did he have to do that? And then Goketsu's head just, boom, just lands right in front of him, and he's like, uh-huh. And Saitama's like, eh, that wasn't a big deal, right? Now, I, th I think we did get, in the Tonkoban, we actually did get, like, a single panel, and I'll throw it up here if I'm remembering this correctly. We got, like, a single panel of Goketsu and Saitama's fight in the city. But it's nothing, it's just, like, a panel. It's just Goketsu going to kick him, I think, and then Saitama just going to punch him. And it was, once again, resolved in a single punch, all right? So, yeah, not, not much of a fight to see at all anyway. But I would have liked to see, like, Goketsu's reaction when he saw Saitama 
walking toward him and like, hey, are you the guy that beat up all those uh, martial artists? He's like, I learned some martial arts. I can spin in a theatrical way now. I can take you down. And you know, Goketsu's just like, what? Okay. And then boom, it's over, right? So not much really there from Goketsu. Uh, Sente Choro, or uh, Elder Centipede, um, he has uh, more appearances, I think, but less character. Uh, at least the fight with him and Saitama was actually shown. And when I say fight, I mean, it's a Saitama fight. So air quotes. But um, yeah, he shows up first when uh, Metal Bat was protecting uh, the kid from the uh, association. And then, you know, uh, he has to fight against Junior Centipede. Centipede first, defeats him, and then Senior Centipede comes out, who's Junior Centipede Senior, and then there's Elder Centipede, who's like the old man of the family, Senti Choro, who's a dragon level threat, all the cadres are dragon level, and he just pops out of the ground and just wrecks the city, and the terrifying thing about Elder Centipede is just like, he's like a kaiju, you know, he's this giant undulating centipede, you could just imagine, like, dragon level threats have always been stated as like, okay, the reason they're dragon level is because they can end multiple multiple cities, like, they can destroy multiple cities at once, and with Elder Centipede, I mean, like, with Boros, you could see that, with all the cadres, you could see that, um, but when it comes to Elder Centipede, the size is, like, apparent right there, like, he pops out of the ground, all it really takes is for him just to, like, snare his body around the city, and then just undulate his whole body, and, like, skyscrapers and everything, it would just be, a, it would be a war zone, like, immediate, like, all these buildings would just be destroyed, like, he could level a city in probably less than a minute if he really wanted to, right? And he just move on, and he's huge. He could just move on to the next city, and then destroy that city, right? So, uh, Metal Bat goes up against him, and that was a pretty metal fight, um, because it's literally just like, okay, I'm gonna land on top of his head, and just like dragon thrashing, and just beat the crap out of him. Um, the head of Elder Centipede is his weak spot, but even hitting that head on, like with Metal Bat's, like one of his strongest moves, just pounding the crap out of it, uh, didn't really do any serious damage. Um, the only people that were able to do serious damage to him uh, aside from Saitama for obvious reasons were Bang and Bomb when they combined their fist of flowing water crushing rock and whirling wind cutting, I don't know, bombs off the cuff, but you know, they combined their their uh, martial arts together and they just did like flowing key rending air and they just did the awesome Dragon Ball like super step on the ground and just punch this thing at once and they just start pounding the crap out of it over and over again and the whole thing just got cracked and shattered apart, uh, but it doesn't matter because it's a centipede, so it molts, uh, going with the Orochimaru school here. It's just like, doesn't matter how much damage the villain takes, um, he's based off of an animal that molts or can shed their skin, so it just sheds its skin and it's fine, <laughs> right? So, and then he just regrows a head and he's back to it. Genos really didn't do much of- Genos did manage to break its tooth. So you can, you, Genos, you can, you can take that accomplishment. You know, Genos doesn't get much, but he, he broke Sente Choro's tooth. And then he got inside of him and he, like, launched his, like, ultimate spiral death cannon inside of its, its gullet. And, um, basically it was just kind of just like a burp, you know, burped up the smoke, but it didn't really do any permanent damage there. Didn't really seem all that damaged by Genos' attack. But, um, the move with, uh, Bang and Bomb, I mean, that was, that was pretty, that was pretty cool, right? So, yeah, that's, and then Saito. Tama just shows up and punches it and obliterates it. That was, like, the last major fight of the season two of the One Punch Man anime, right? So, it went out on a good note. We got to see a serious punch at the end there. Okay, that's whatever. Um, and I also love, because Sente Choro is so freaking big and so long, I guess. He has lots of length, you know? And so, whenever Saitama punched him, it, it was being disintegrated, but it happened slowly. Because it's like the body had to be slowly destroyed as it was going on. So, Saitama punches it. It, and then him and King continue to have a full conversation, like walking through the woods. I'm like, wonder where everybody is. Oh, there's Genos. Meanwhile, the entire tail of the centipede is still being destroyed in the background. And then finally, the centipedes have those two like hairs on the back. I think they're legs or modified tails or whatever at the very end of their bodies. And it just snaps off at the end and they just like wiggle and then they just disappear. Um, it took like a while for the shockwave of Saitama's punch to ring through the whole body. So yeah, that that was Goketsu and Sente Choro and Nyan, the three uh, new cadres. But now we get into the ones that were introduced only, well, introduced in the webcomic, and they're like the original core member, like the strongest ones. Like Goketsu and Sente Choro, you know, they got saitama so we didn't really, we did get a, a scale for how strong they were, because Suiru, Suiru was easily an S-class fighter. I mean, he wouldn't have been top rank S-class, but I think Suiru could have easily been like rank 15, 16, 17, 
2014 around like Tank Top Master, Puri Puri Prisoner, Siru would probably rank right around there, right? Um, and you know, he didn't even do anything. He couldn't even dent freaking Goketz um, in an Elder Centipede. Just, the, you know, honestly, I'm looking at it, I'm like, Phoenix Man talked about the four heroes that could potentially defeat him. He talked about Blast because he's Blast and he injured Elder Centipede before. Uh, Tatsumake for obvious reasons. Uh, Metal Knight because he has all the technology that even the Monster Association doesn't know about. Uh, he could end him. And then King. Because King, all, all King had, well, King actually did finish him off. You know, they just let Saitama take the credit. Um, so yeah, uh, beyond those three S-Class, though, I can't really think a lot of other S-Class. I mean, maybe Atomic Samurai could do it, because all Atomic Samurai would have to do, like, most of the time whenever Elder Centipede got attacked, it was always through, like, some sort of an attack that, like, cracked its exoskeleton, and then it just regenerated or just molted. What if Atomic Samurai came out with his sword and just diced this thing into, like, little pieces of sushi? Like, not, not just cracking its shell like the entire way around but like literally slicing it apart so there's a chunk over there there's a chunk over there and there's just like a plate of centipede sushi like would it be able to regenerate from that i mean maybe if the head was still alive maybe it could slowly regrow or something but i, I think atomic could maybe take out care of it all he would have to figure out is a way to cut through the uh, the carapace because the carapace on sente choro is like ridiculously tough uh even metal knight commented on its toughness you know and metal knight was launching like you know you know um, air to surface missiles had you know they hit him and he's like wow this thing's pretty tough it's not really getting even dented by these missiles so yeah i mean but i think atomic samurai could probably slice through it and and that would be not a problem pig god that might be even more food than pig bo pig god can handle right but uh i think there's some other heroes that maybe could handle uh sente choro but now moving on to the core group of the uh the cadres here let's see who am i gonna start let's start with overgrown rover okay because there's really not much to talk about because rover is not really he doesn't doesn't really have like he doesn't talk he's a dog you know unlike neon who when neon became a monster neon could actually speak and have like its own personality and things rover was a dog that got turned into a monster but is still very much a dog uh personality wise you know like if you make it mad it will attack you uh you know you could just basically tell it to sit give it a really stern voice and maybe you know like teach it a lesson i, I don't hit dogs you know that's not nice saitama why'd you have to hit a puppy you know but it's like you 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 yell at it and it'll be like, you know, so that's Overgrown Rover. Very physically intimidating, though. Um, I think in the webcomic... Now, this is a little difference here, so let me know how you feel about this. I believe in the webcomic, when Garo first ran into Overgrown Rover, they actually had a little bit of a brawl there that ended with Garo kind of hitting it and being like, sit, sit, boy. And then, you know, he knocked him through some walls and stuff. In the, we in the manga, when Garo ran into him, he was with the kid, and Garo showed, like, visible fear at this thing. You know, it's like this giant, multi-eyed dog, you know, black fur that's, like, standing up on end, and it's just, like, smoke, like, from a volcano is just geysering out of this thing's mouth, and it's just like... Rush. Garo was just like... Whoa. Okay, this might be a problem here. Just slowly back up, kid. And they slowly back up, and then they run into those other monsters, like the Super Mouse. And they, in the process of that fight, attack the rover and piss it off. And then it starts charging at them or blasting. It can launch, like, key blasts from its mouth. Um, you know, like, charge attack and just, like, obliter, like, like super heat shot, you know? Um, so, how do you feel about that? You know, because I, I think the way that, um, in the manga version, the way that they did it was just like we want to show a little bit more fear in, in the cadres like the cadres are really powerful and also garo wasn't really at his next stage of evolution yet so maybe murata wanted to really focus on garo getting progressively stronger as he's gotten beaten down throughout the association like he got beat down by orochi and had the next evolution but at that stage in his monster evolution he wasn't um strong enough to take down rover now eventually saitama runs into him and he's just like hey sit boy and just punches him and he goes down and he's like so, yeah, and in, in the webcomic right now, Rover is basically like Saitama's pet. He's been downsized a bit, right? So, yeah, he's, he's just a dog, though, but he's a very dangerous kind of pup, so watch him. He needs to go for at least two walks a day. You need to make sure he has a balanced diet and all that stuff, you know? Okay, um... Let's see. I'm trying to I'm trying to talk about the ones that had less screen time or like their abilities aren't so ridiculous over the top. There's there's two 
characters with abilities in particular, I'm going to stay for the end, and I think you know which ones they are, okay? Um, how about we talk about Gums next? All right, this is Gums right here. Gums looks to me like if, okay, did you ever have a fear of the dentist or the orthodontist growing up? Um... I kind of did. I, I never liked to go to the dentist. I, I um, certainly wasn't, like, afraid to the same level. Like, I'm, I'm afraid of wasps. Like, I'm deathly afraid if I see a yellow jacket or a wasp. I will freak the hell out. Um, I wasn't like that with dentists. I just didn't really like to go. In fact, when, he, when I was a little kid, when I was probably, like, oh, actually not even little, when I was probably around 10 years old, I, I wanted my dad to stand in the room with me when I was getting my teeth cleaned because it was just, I just hated that sensation, right, so much. Still, it's it's not the greatest moment for me now, but whatever. But, you know, dentists, for the most part, they're not trying to hurt you. You know, you have this idea that a dentist is like, let me drill your teeth. You're not flossing right, are you? You know, and it's like, oh, okay, I could feel that, you know. Um, but most dentists are cool. My dentist is an all right guy. You know, he sits down, talks to me. He's like, hey, Matt, how are you doing? How's the YouTube going? You know, whatever. Um, but imagine if you really had that vindictive dentist or the or an orthodontist, the kind of dentist that, like, got a sick pleasure out of causing you harm. Um, Gums would be the mascot for that guy's office. Like, you imagine taking, like, a little kid, like a five-year-old kid to the dentist for the first time. And it's like, don't worry, little Billy. You know, you'll be fine. It's just the dentist. You pull up to a, a, a building, and there's, like, a giant statue of gums over the building just kind of staring down at you. No eyes, no nose, just a giant maw, just teeth. Giant teeth sticking out in this amorphous pink body with like a bunch of like just just vestigial toes and fingers and stuff and just like and just like Dr. McPain's dentistry. <laughs> you know, the little kid would be like you know, um, that's what I imagine Gums. In fact, Gums might have been that. I mean, he might have been, yes, he was a, an orthodontia uh, mascot that got turned into this. All of the fear of every child in the entire world collated and this thing became what it is now, all right? So Gums, once again, doesn't really have much of a personality, does not speak, doesn't even know if it, I mean, it, it comprehends languages, it can listen to orders, but, uh, you know, it doesn't speak on its own. So, so, um, the, it obviously goes up against Pig God because he's kind of genetically engineered to go up against Pig God. You know, Pig, Bo Pig God eats all of the monsters and Gums is literally just a mouth and teeth and, and, and a giant, I guess the rest of it is just a stomach. Does it, does it have other organs? Does it have lungs? Does it have kidneys? I think that whole body is just one big giant stomach, you know? Um, and so, uh, Pig God is eating the great food tub, just kind of slurping up, just... And then Gums just appears and then just swallows Pig God whole and just starts to digest it. But then Pig God, you know, he's a little bit, he doesn't get eaten, he eats. That's what Pig God does. His superpower is that he's fat. So don't freaking throw him out of the way when it comes to an eating competition, all right? So he kind of fumbles around in Gums' stomach and Gums kind of like barfs him back. This is a very disgusting battle. <laughs> you know, barfs him back up. And then there's this funny scene where Pig God hits the ground and he just like, he's like just dripping with goo and he just gets up and his eyes are just glowing like a worthy challenger at last. And then Pig God and Gums just like clash with each other and they have a good old fashioned fat off. You know, that's, that's their battle. And unfortunately we don't get to see most of the battle. It, cut, it cuts back later in the webcomic and Gums has just defeated Pig God. Gums can like, kind of like a snake, like unhinge its jaw if it even has a jaw. Mostly it looks kind of rubbery and elastic, so it can literally just take its mouth and just like and just open it as lo as big as it needs to be, and just like take one big bite out of Pig God and he's just kind of chewing on him. Um, and the end of Pig God, I mean the end, well not the end of Pig God, but the end of Gums is very abrupt. Uh, basically it's uh, during the final part of the battle there when Tatsumaki rips everybody out of the ground and now they're on the surface, right? And Gums is there, and Gums basically just gets its head lopped off, well, head lopped off by Bang. You know, Bang steps out and just one shot's freaking Fuhrer Ugly, punches a hole right through him, and then Gums is there like, huh? 
and then Bang just proceeds to just lop off, like, cuts its, like, jaw right here, like, between the teeth, and just lops off that upper section, and it just drops, and it dies. So, yeah, Gums didn't really get that much screen time, but just from the appearance alone, very big nightmare fuel, especially if you're afraid of, uh, if you're afraid of a dentist or an orthodontist. That looked rather terrifying, right? Um, I honestly, I kind of want to see, for some reason, I don't even know why, maybe this is just a messed up version of me, just for comedic effect, I want to see fan art of Gums, but, you know, he, he got braces put on, so there's, like, a scene with Gums just letting out that giant smile with braces, and he just, like, putting his, like, his thumb up, like, and then you could put that, if, if I ever ran an orthodontist office, I never would, because, God no, but if I ever find myself running an orthodontist office, that would be the kind of picture you would see when you walk in. You'd see a picture of Gums wearing braces, like, giving the thumbs up, and like a caption underneath it, like, you know, even the strongest of us need braces, or something like that. I don't know why, I just thought that'd be funny to see him with braces, okay? Because he's, he's mostly just teeth, and Gums, considering his name. Okay, so yeah. Um, let's see, so I, I I mentioned Fear Ugly just now. Let's talk about him. All right. Fear Ugly is a special type of monster. He is known as an Ugmon, all right? And the way that my Mask explained this is that um, when it comes to when people are ridiculed, and it, this could be for a number of reasons, like they're, they just have, like, they're not very confident with their appearance, or maybe they were born with some kind of deformity, um, and they just, like, feel like everybody's, like, ridiculing them and making fun of them for the way they look. At least in the world of One Punch Man, you become a monster called an Ugmon in that state. Um, and he also specifies like a lot of times it's like by rejection of the opposite sex so if you're constantly just rejected and you can't find love you you become this this being where the ugliness on the outside i mean the ugliness on the inside comes on down to the surface on the outside that's sort of the the poeticness of the ugmon you know you just don't nux you need to do a video on this no one understands the ugmon or the philosophy of the ugmon or whatever okay and so fear ugly was probably one of the most uh prominent of these Ugmon, you know, the way that um, my mask spoke about them, like not all Ugmon are like ridiculously powerful threats. You know, some of them might just be like ridiculed for like they like people always make fun of my nose, and so they become an Ugmon, but they're like a wolf or a tiger level threat. You know, uh, apparently Fuhrer Ugly, he was just so ugly, so it's like it's like ugliness and ridicule equal strength, equal battle power, or your threat level in this instance. So Fuhrer Ugly was just so so ridiculed, like not a single person probably loved him or even wanted to look at him. It generated so much malice and hatred, he turned into this and a dragon level threat to boot. All right, so Fear Ugly, uh, very fast, very wicked strong, but his prime ability is that he's ugly. Okay, and for my Mask, this is like the worst possible opponent. my Mask, very arrogant guy. He always feels like, I am the beautiful my Mask. I can take down any monster, no matter how tough. To the point where he even talks down to some of the highest ranked S-classes. Like, Atomic Samurai, he treats like, you know, inferior to him, you know? Um, I kind of want to see that battle. I want to see an my Mask versus freaking Atomic Samurai brawl, you know? Um, but anyway, yeah, he's, uh, he, he seems very confident in his skills, but whenever he encountered Fuhrer Ugly, man. He was just like, I can't win this battle. I just can't. It's impossible. I can't do it. Look at him. He's just so ugly. Now I'm reminding the SpongeBob episode. We're just like, we're ugly, SpongeBob. <laughs> you know, like, and so he's running around. His, like, his outfit is, like, super small for him. And he's got this, like, giant out, uh, Audi belly button. And even when he went to go, like, um, uh, kick one of, uh, oh, I know what it was. Yeah, when on my mask, he was carrying the severed head of a monster, and then Fuhrer Ugly started walking and running toward him, and then on my mask, like, sensed him and, like, threw the head, and Fuhrer Ugly just did this awesome, like, you know, like, this high jump kick thing and kicked the head through the ceiling, and you got to see, like, his pants ripped, and you could see his boxers underneath it, and he's got, like, this really mangled face, and one of his eyes, like, his eyes are, like, you know, like, wall-eyed or whatever, and they're, like, lopsided, and he just constantly has snot dripping down his nose, He's constantly drooling. His teeth are all crooked, and his like his his face, his head, his malformed. His little tufts of hair po poofing out, and he's just like, "Hi ah, there, I'm on mask. I'm a friend of you. I'm a fan of yours, actually. Let's have a good old fashioned brawl, you know." And so that's 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 fear ugly. 
actually. And you know what? I thought there was going to be a little bit more with him, actually. I thought there was going to be. And it doesn't really go anywhere. Um, you know, my mask doesn't really stand up to the fight there, and he ends up getting defeated by Bang as well. Uh, what happens is Genos gets into the battle, and he basically, he's missing both of his arms at this point. They got ripped off by Black Sperm and by Gums, I think, ripped off Genos' arms. So all he has is, are his legs. So he doesn't, he's like, man... There's nothing I can do here. I'm missing arms, and I'm not even that strong to take on these cadres. But screw it. I gotta do something. You gotta give Genos that much. At least he tries, you know? So he doesn't just run away. He's like, I gotta try at least something. So Genos tries to just kick um, Fear Ugly in the face as hard as he can, just to kind of, like, rip off his head. And he just... Boom! And Fear Ugly just like, oh, you want to go, huh? And then he just turns into a giant hulking brute form of, of pure ugliness. And um, he's like, oh, Genos is like, oh, okay, well, I've been here before. I know where this is going. And I'm going to get completely curb stomped. But um, Bang shows up and then just, boom, blasts a hole right through him. And he just drops like... <laughs> ending the ugliness once and for all. Yeah, but that's 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 fear ugly. I mean, just in terms of, like, the comedic effect between him and a My Mask, I mean, that's worth the whole show right there. Even more so, like, the Pig God and Gums fight is pretty funny, mostly because they don't really, they both don't really talk very much, but when it comes to a My Mask and fear ugly, that's just, that's just funny. All right, so uh, let's see, who else? Who else do we got here? Well, we only have really one more uh, before we get to the last two that I want to discuss here. So I want you to introduce you, Barry. I I want to introduce you to a friend here. Um, this is my friend. I'm just going to set him on top of Barry here very carefully. All right, so this is Evil Natural Water, or ENW, because the most badass characters and techniques are always abbreviations. D4C, GER, you know, those were JoJo references in case you didn't get that. But, you know, Evil Natural Water, I haven't heard a lot of people call him ENW, but that's starting now. He's ENW, all right? So Evil Natural Water, um, it's a water elemental. Like, if just one of, like, D&D terms or just other mythologies, like, he's a water elemental. He's water that is quasi-sentient, doesn't really have its own personality. Even it was stated that Goro Goro, uh, who is psychos and has psychic abilities and kind of, like, gather everybody together, had a very difficult time handling uh, ENW. And so it's basically just contained in a like a reinforced aquarium inside the Monster Association, and it was only let out when like the heroes invaded, and there was really no other option. One of the monsters let it go. Um, so ENW is mostly water, but also some floating eyeballs are inside of it, and some mad doctor fish, just random fish. And the fish themselves not very powerful; they're like a tiger level threat. Um, and so uh, Ian and just like the other disciples of Atomic Samurai just slice the fish down like not a big deal but the fish aren't the problem the problem is the fact you have to fight water all right so not even just water to the sense of just like i mean yeah uh, even child emperor hypothesized like you could probably heat it up and maybe it would evaporate but it's water so it's like you evaporate it into steam i don't think that would kill it i think it would still like it would turn into steam and then like maybe just go into the atmosphere and then when it rained he would just be reformed right uh we've seen enw survive a straight up punch from saitama and it, you know, whenever it gets an attack of severe damage, it will burst apart into water, but then just give it a few minutes and it'll just come back. It's like the T-1000. It'll just, like, reform. You know, it's it's a liquid. It's really hard to kill this thing, right? Um, it, it doesn't speak, but it does have sort of, like, pre-programmed orders and it does care about its own well-being. Um, it's stated that it responds to the emotions of those that are around it. So, if you have, like, a very malicious intent, uh, it might try to attack you first to kind of end your existence, right? Um, or stuff like that. It actually avoided attacking King because it could sense the fear that King was genuinely feeling. You know, everyone else was just like, oh, he's not attacking King. King's that badass. He's just so intimidating. Even ENW is not reacting. But no, ENW could sense like, wait a second, this guy's ge this genuine fear. So I'm not going to attack him. All right. Because he's not a threat to me. Right. He's afraid of me. But uh, then when he senses Saitama's presence, it all like collates behind Saitama. And Saitama's like, what? 
boom, and just obliterates it. Uh, even after the battle, even after the fight was over and Garo and everything was taken care of, um, it, it was still not dead yet uh, after a strike from Saitama. Uh, Pig God was actually very proactive here. He left the hospital, went back to the battlefield with all the rubble, and he was digging around trying to find this thing because he had a feeling like this this thing's like, a, it's, it's, it, it's probably still alive. And so one of the heroes went to go bring Pig God back. His name was Air, and he used a boomerang to kind of fight and I think it was Air. He was a very kind of like his his personality was very much like you know oh you uh, you S class heroes didn't train enough to defeat the monsters. That's why you know you're so banged up and everything like that. I'll teach you a lesson for not uh, you know taking your position seriously, right? So I think it was that kind of intent from Air that awakened Evil Natural Water, and he wasn't reformed completely. It was like a smaller version of him, but he attacked Air and like you know, drilled a hole straight through his neck. How it attacks is just pressurized water jets um or i mean really it could just guomp you you know you know what guomping is it could just like guomp you and then you just can't breathe and then if you can't figure out some way to break through it you would just drown inside of it but its main methods of attacking are just shooting out extremely condensed extremely high pressure water jets that can just like sh just like slice a building in half you know or a mountain in half or whatever it's a dragon level threat why not right um so anyway after it attacks air pig god appears from behind this thing and just like Rah! and just like swallows the thing whole and while swallowing it it begins to continuously attack him like shooting out the water jets outside of pig god's body and he's like bleeding and stuff but eventually um apparently anyway it gets digested by pig god and it gets dissolved in his his juices his gastric juices um and so that's like he up he appears to be that it's dead you know it got dissolved you know it didn't get evaporated or anything the water just got dissolved inside pig god so evil natural water should be dead but you never know. Maybe maybe he'll pop out of Pig God's body. It's like his familiar now. And he's like fights on his behalf. Why not, right? All right. So, you know, I'm just going to leave you up there, buddy. Why not, right? Yeah, there he is. Little googly eyes. All right. So the last two uh, I want to talk about. Let, let's talk about... Um, Okay, don't laugh. This is a very serious name, all right? You, you, do, you do not look down on this guy. If there's one thing you do not do on this earth, it's look down on... Black sperm. What was that? I said black... Black sperm! Can we just call him BS if we're just doing the abbreviation? Actually, you know what? That's actually appropriate because BS, his power is kind of bullshit if we're being honest here. All right. So, uh, uh, BS is a tiny little monster. Doesn't seem to be that threatening at first anyway. Uh, seems like a little tiny guy, like three foot tall, wearing a really funny elf costume that he dyed black, right? Um, his face, human face, or as human as it can get. And, uh, you know, he could speak. He has his person and everything like that. Um, his ability is very simple to understand, but even after you understand it, it's one of those things that's just like so ridiculous that you just can't win. All right, his ability is uh, splitting, or I think coalescence was the official name of it, okay? So basically, there's a, a, a bunch of him inside of him. It's like us. It's a cell stock. You know how like there's like right now there's a bunch of cells in your body. You know and like if you're you know you're a man you have sperm. You're a woman you have your eggs and stuff. You're right. This is sex edge class with teching 101. But hey, his name is Black Sperm. What do you want from me? Okay. Um. But anyway, yeah. There's like a a very powerful cell stock inside of him so that whenever he gets damaged through pretty much any means, like he gets sliced or he gets twisted or he gets burnt or he gets blasted apart or he gets shot. You know any or he gets crushed. Any sort of damage that happens to him, he just replicates again and again and again. It's a very simple splitting ability. And even Atomic Samurai said, you know, I fought against monsters that were the splitting types like you. And they're the most annoying types because you know how it goes. You know, you have one monster coming after you. you. You cut him. He splits into two. You cut those monsters up. Two splits into four. Four becomes eight. Eight becomes 16. It's like the Hydra of Greek myth. It's like Heracles going up against the freaking Hydra. You slice off the head and it's just like, you know, two heads sprout out of the neck wound and it's just like this never-ending thing of like constant attrition right so you got to figure out some other way but even with the hydra the hydra was like you burned its stump you cartilized the wound and the heads wouldn't reproduce apparently with black sperm that's not how that works you can't just attack him with fire and he's just no he'll keep splitting okay so um the reason why this is so broken and and kind of bullshit is the exact number of hymns inside of him all right 
How many do you think? If you don't know, how many? I would say, like, you know, there's a lot. Maybe a hundred? A hundred of yous. I mean, that's a pretty powerful, you know, thing. You have a hundred of yous to call upon at any time. But, you know, this is One Punch Man. This is all about being over the top and things. I mean, look at Saitama. So how about a thousand? Five thousand. You know what? Well, fifty thousand. Fifty. Th having an, a personal army of fifty thousand versions of you, even if each individual one is very weak, and each individual one is pretty weak. But that's not the point, because they're never alone. Very rarely, uh, right now in the story. But you know what I mean? Like, there's so many of them. Like, they're never having to worry about being alone, right? And they can always increase their cell stock even more by eating protein. That was actually a thing uh, Murata stated. He's like, if they eat protein, you know, eat a lot of peanut butter. There's protein in peanut butter or whatever. You like a protein shake and they can increase their cell stocks that way um but no no 50,000 what about what about 500,000 a million screw it screw it the population of the United States I think it's like what like what are we up to like 315 million 315 something million of you inside of you like that's an army that's a country you have inside of you it's even higher than that a billion Two billion. Screw it. The population of the Earth. Like 7.8 billion. 10 billion. Okay, I'll just tell you. We don't know the exact, exact, exact number, but it's over 10 trillion. Yeah. I said that. 10 over 10 trillion. I'm going to do a little bit of math here really quick. Just give me a sec. Um, all right. So uh, math is not my strong suit here. So let's see if I can figure this out. All right. So let's say, let's say you killed 10,000 of these little bastards every single minute. You are like slicing these things down like a freaking machine. 10,000 black sperms are dropping every single minute. Okay. That would take like... Okay, I don't think I got this right. It would, it would take a lot of years, okay? It was like 19 million. I don't think that's right. Because according to that, that would take 19 million years. That might be right. I don't know. It might be 19,000. I might have not did my math right. But whatever. It would take a lot of years, all right, if you even were taking out that many that quickly, all right? So, uh, yeah. Now, now, there are ways around this, okay? Uh, Atomic Samurai in the manga version figured out that if he, like, condenses down his slashes into, like, pinpointed compressed slashes, he can actually just... <laughs> just annihilate, just atomize one of the black sperms before they even had a chance to reproduce. All right, but he couldn't use that technique repeatedly, and he was just mastering it, just learning how it really worked, right? So he couldn't do it over and over and over again, and it took a lot out of him, okay? So it is possible to just eliminate them, but you really have to be, like, focused perfectly. So that's that's a weakness there, but it's a weakness that doesn't really come up so often, so it doesn't even matter, really. It's, once again, it's a war of attrition. Like, you understand what the number of characters this thing is. Like, it could literally just overwhelm anything like you could have a reinforced castle with an entire army of of a million strong outside ready to protect its walls freaking black sperm could appear like as a literal tidal wave like a mile high and a mile wide of just you know like a sperm t <laughs> just it attacks you and just washes over the freaking castle and just obliterates everybody you know it's like you don't even stand a chance and there's way more to spare you know how big of a number one trillion is do you know how big of a number one billion is you know like it's a number that humans don't have to encounter very often so it's really kind of like this abstract concept but that's what i love about one punch man you know they're sitting down one is sitting down creating this character and he's like you know what i'm gonna make it a ridiculous number i could just make it a billion if he made it one billion that would be ridiculous in and of itself but he's like no screw it this is a crazy over-the-top manga it fits the tone it fits like the comedic aspects of the series um and like saitama and his power is just so ridiculously unfair and the number of like ways he could split himself with you know bs it just like that seems unfair like 10 trillion are you serious here are you serial but i think it works with this series and i just found it i just found it funny you know okay like there's just it's a sense of dread it's just like what are you gonna do to that like you could spend your whole life hacking apart these things like he the, the sad thing is Black Sperm, he wouldn't even have to fight you. He could literally just stand there and let you kill him over and over and over and over and over again. 
you would die of old age before you ended him. Unless you're like a ridiculously powerful S-class hero. Unless you're Saitama or Tatsumaki. Unless you're some ridiculously powerful character. Um, you know, unless you're that, you really, you have no chance, right? Now, he does have a weakness. He does have a weakness. The we aside from just the incineration thing. The weakness is he can shoot, like he said, each individual body is pretty weak. So he can't really damage you that much. I mean, he could just overwhelm you, so it doesn't even matter. But if he wants to, he could take his body and coalesce them together to create a larger body. And he could do this with any number. So he could take a hundred of himself and create a fully, like, a, you know, like he takes his original base strength times 100 and creates a new body. The downside is that body seems to have its own personality uh, when it takes on that form. And also, uh, if it gets hurt and dies, it doesn't split. It's like, okay, there are, you've basically converted 100 of its cells into one of its bodies. Okay, so if you kill the 100 body, uh, you know, black sperm, then that's dead for good. Those cells are gone. All right. Um, and so what it even did is it can make multicellular sperm. <laughs> I, I have, the, I, like I said, I have the mentality of a five-year-old, so I find it just really funny I have to keep saying that word, right? So anyway, um, it can take any number of its bodies uh, and then convert them into a bigger body, uh, and those are called multicellular sperms, okay? And so any number, I think, lower than uh, 10 trillion. And it can choose to take 10 trillion cells, or just about. It's like 9 trillion, 999 billion, 999 million, 999,000, 999 cells all together and then boom golden sperm is born with a blast and golden sperm is like ridiculously powerful like tatsumaki even tried to like rip its head off and it just it resisted tatsumaki's like psychic powers now granted tatsu was in a weakened state and her powers were kind of unstable at that time and murata even or one came out and said that yeah if um Tatsumaki was at full power and fought against Golden Sperm, then, you know, he, I, mean, I don't think he said it was a guaranteed win for Tatsumaki, but it was definitely in her, in her favor that she could beat him. Um, but still, 10 trillion cells in one body, that's absolutely absurdly ridiculous, okay? Um, and so it was ridiculously strong, but then Gar, it was kind of unfortunate because Golden Sperm kind of ended up just being like, uh, like fodder for Garo. Garo showed up in his monster form and then beat the crap out of Golden Golden Sperm is like, this is how strong Garo is now. Like, whoa. But other than that, Golden Sperm, you don't want to mess with Golden Sperm. Like, he's radiating so much power. His muscles have so much energy. Like, you could just, like, touch his muscles and you would just explode from how much power he exudes, right? And also, the main issue for uh, BS here is that even if you kill him... You know, he could just, like, separate his body and have one of his bodies go over there. And unless you make sure they're all dead, they could always repopulate. They can always build up their cell stock again and again and again and again. So you got to make sure every single solitary cell of these guys are dead. And it's just probably not going to happen because when the fight is even looking like it's not going to go their way, it'll just separate and then set off some, like, okay, well, you go over there and you escape and then I'll take the hit. Um, they can also blow themselves, you know, the, the kingdom come if they want to. They could just go in for, like, a kamikaze attack and just like do that um and i think it sent like ten thousand at tatsumaki just to distract and tatsumaki is you have to understand tatsumaki is so ridiculously powerful because it's like ten thousand of these things detonating all at once didn't even cause like 20 seconds of a distraction for tatsumaki like not even a big deal right so yeah but uh, against like pretty much any other s-class hero uh or saitama like you know they, there's no way that they would be able they would be able to win unless it was tatsu or saitama or, like, Blast, or, man, I, I mean, like, even Bang would have a tough time, Atomic Samurai had a tough time, like, you know, it's just the sheer number of these things, it's, it's unfair, is what it is, really, but that's BS, and his power is BS, so yeah, um, but let's move on now to my favorite member of the, uh, the, uh, cadres, and that's, of course, Homeless Emperor. <sighs> I love you, one, I love this story. There's a character named Homeless Emperor. 
All right, let me explain to you the premise of this guy, and I just find it hilarious, okay? So, it's sort of building off of the, uh, like, the stereotypical view of a homeless man. You know, like a homeless guy who basically just spends his whole, his whole day hanging out under a bridge, begging for change, and, you know, mumbling to himself. Like, you know, the old man that's like, I saw Jesus the other day. He was, he was in a mud puddle, and he told me to put this platypus on my head. You know, it, it takes the, um, the, the, uh, the viewpoint of, like, a stereotypical, like, homeless man, like, talking to God is, like, no. It makes this literal. Like, God is a real character in One Punch Man. He's an actual character that appeared and gave this homeless man the power to manipulate light and heat energy at will. And he can fly and do all this crazy stuff, right? And so that, that's the thing. So he was an office worker that uh, really has a lawsuit on his hands here, if we're being honest. He was an office worker, like a regular salary man, and there was like a party once, and the boss of the company forced this poor guy to dance naked, and then he got, you know, a sexual harassment lawsuit filed against him, and then he got fired, and he was homeless, right? But it's like the boss was the one that ordered him to do that. So honestly, homeless, homeless emperor, I think, you have a court case on your hands here. I definitely think you could, uh, you know, I mean, you can't hire a lawyer unless the lawyer is also homeless. You know, it's like, I, I'm a homeless Joe. I'm the lawyer to all homeless peoples in this county. Give me that, give me that squirrel. <laughs> you know, okay, but no, all right, anyway. So yeah, he has the power of a god, uh, which is hilarious. He wears like an old torn up tracksuit. What's funny is even after awakening the god powers, he still dresses like a homeless man. Because the idea is being homeless, he began to like open his eyes to how big the world was and he's just like I don't need to live my life behind a cubicle I don't need to live my life with the daily grind you know the rat race of life all I need is just to sprawl out and just stare at the sky in this big open world we live in and just breathe the fresh air that's all we need and then God appears before you and gives you Dragon Ball powers apparently it gives you the power to like manipulate key and shit so you know, have you tried it enough? I want you guys to, you know, try, you know, be homeless for a few weeks and maybe you unlock superpowers. I don't know. I've never been homeless. I don't know how this shit works. All right. But anyway, yeah, he still dresses like a homeless man. He wears like a cape and a crown. I can only imagine he got the crown from like a Burger King dumpster. You know, he goes into a Burger King dumpster and finds an old paper crown and puts it on, you know, and he just kept it that way. You know, he's got mustard stains all over his freaking, his track suit and everything he smells like a dumpster but it's like hey he's got magic powers so what are you gonna do you gonna make fun of him you won't last long so he fights against zombie man and it was a pretty cool fight and so he's taking these energy orbs and he's just punching holes. He's turning Zombie Man into Swiss cheese. And, you know, even with Zombie Man's regeneration, like, this is bad news. This is going to take a while to heal. And so he kind of tries to goad him into talking about his life. And Homeless Emperor, he is a little bit... I think because he met God, he feels like he has to be God's messenger. So he has to do the whole spiel with just like, I was lost in my life, but then I found meaning. And then I met God and he gave me these powers to summon light orbs and defeat, you know, even the strongest monsters and heroes. You know, that is my purpose. That is my destiny. So yeah, certainly Homeless Emperor was one of the strongest uh, cadres in the Monster Association, okay? Because these these orbs are no joke. Like, they constantly, like, levitate around him, and any attack that comes in, it just intercepts, and then they have incredible destructive power and, like, combustion whenever they come in contact with something. So they're very, very dangerous. And he seemingly can create, like, an infinite number of these things. Like, he doesn't seem like he has a set limit. So, the way he died was kind of weird. Um, you know, most of the battles he was in, he was winning pretty good, and then he encounters Zombie Man a second time, and, uh, no, 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 it was before that with King, yeah. So, King's there, and Homeless Emperor's trying to figure out a way to attack him, he's like, how am I gonna attack the strongest hero in the world, even I have to be cautious. Then Zombie Man appears, and kinda catches him by surprise and knocks him down, and the idea here is, like, you can't, you know, like, I'm holding you down, and he has, like, had him dead to rights with his pistol, and he's like, you can't use those light attacks now, those energy bombs, because you'll be caught in the explosion as well and so zombie man was kind of skeptical because he is a homeless man so zombie man was kind of skeptical about like okay your power comes from a god like an actual like god is real and gave you powers so it's like how how do your powers actually work and at that moment um homeless emperor has a vision where god is there and like he's like naked in a field of flowers and god by the way in case you're curious god looks like this he's like um 
a Resident Evil zombie with, like, flesh kind of stretching all over his place and weird, like, muscle tendons. I have no idea, but he has a humanoid shape, at least. And God was just like, You disappoint me, homeless man. I am taking my powers back. And he takes the powers back, and then Homeless Emperor just kind of explodes in, like, a bloody mess. His body just begins to contort, and he begins, like, the hemorrhage blood out of his eyes and nose, and he just, like, and then he dies. So, yeah. So, uh, you can either look at it, like, two ways. You can either say that God is a real character that gave him this power, and eventually we're gonna, like, run into this God character at some point, which, I mean... I can't think of a better enemy for Saitama to fight, you know? It's like, just make it literally God. Um, but also, like, you could view it like because he was so crazy and homeless, it was the vision of God he saw and that awakened his monster powers. Like, God isn't real or anything. It's just, like, that was his natural monster ability. And at that moment when Zombie Man caught him down, he maybe he had doubt in the ability. And he just, like, what? My power didn't stop him this time. And then he just, like, he gave up his faith. His faith wavered, and then that's what ended him. Um, but, or, I, I like to think the fun part is, like, there's an actual God character. That, that's what, you know, is most interesting, right? So, yeah, that, that's Homeless Emperor, though. He's my favorite, just the way he looks and his backstory and just the weird thing about God and connections to him and everything. So, I hope the God character appears later. I mean, I hope that they, they tie that back in the loose ends and stuff. Um, but other than that, yeah, most of the, uh, most of the cadres are dead. Uh, uh, e Evil Natural Water's dead, Fear Ugly's dead, Sente Choro's dead, Gums is dead, Goketz is dead, Neon we don't know yet, uh, he'll probably be dead by the end of the arc, Rover is Saitama's pet now, Black Sperm is reduced to just one now, and he's trying to revitalize his cell stock, and he's also kind of, uh, Saitama's pet, and Homeless Emperor is also dead, so, yeah, most of them are wiped out now at this point in the webcomic, but hey, the, uh, the manga's still going, the Murata comic, and I'm really excited into seeing these fights, we had, basically we're ending the initial fights between the S-Clash right now, but we're gonna get into those bigger fights coming in, the final battle with everybody and, like, the wreckage and all that stuff, and, like, Psychos, and it's all a really cool battle, so I can't wait to see that. I can't wait to see King busting out his, like, hell demon wave motion cannon or whatever that was said, so th there's a lot of cool stuff coming up, right? So, yeah, this, this was a long video, understandably, kind of a long video, but uh, let me know who your favorite cadre was in One Punch Man. Thanks for watching, everybody. This will be Teching 101. So, Signing out.